Okay, so good morning folks. Um, my name's Tim Brown and I'm here to talk about big game hunting, finding bugs on enterprise systems. Enterprise systems with echoes. Okay, right, so um, we'll kick off. Um, who am I? I'm Tim. I'm head of research at Paul Cullis. Um, I'm sure there's lots of details on the internet about me. Feel free to go and have a look. Um, so the background. I've spent the last 15 years working in security, um, primarily on the Unix side. Um, I've worked for a number of telcos and banks um, in their security operations team. Um, worked with a variety of different Unixes from AIX through to Dynex through to SCO and then the more common ones, Red Hat, Solaris, etc. Um, so the, this talk is based on that. Um, it's based on the, the stuff I've learned and the appreciation that maybe not everybody has the same, the same level of experience. Um, I should say now, there aren't any, any, going to be any zero days in this talk. There will be some interesting design, design decisions around some of the stuff that IBM's done. Steve did tell me to imagine there were no IBM lawyers in the room, um, but I don't think they'll be offended even if they are here. <coughs> so, <coughs> the plan for the talk. Going to look at essentially three main areas. Going to look at auditing, um, the problems that are associated with that, and maybe some solutions. We're going to look at what you can do going further, because I don't think auditing actually captures um, customer requirements properly. Um, and then finally, we're going to go through some of the stuff we've got in our lab um, and things you might want to do at home in order to, in order to improve your, your testing procedures. So, auditing, problems and solutions. Problems. There's limited access, varying different levels of OS capability. Um, there are multiple solutions in many cases to, to, to issues that may exist on, on these platforms, and there are differences in requirements. So we'll step through each of these in turn, and I'll give you a bit more information about what I'm talking about. So limited, uh, we've, lost, we've lost a slide I think there. So limited access, um, generally um, we, we like to have hands-on access when we're doing audits of systems. Sometimes we have clients who won't let us touch the keyboard, um, and they want scripts, um, and that's not an, ideal, not an ideal place to be because a lot of the stuff that actually makes systems valuable gets added post facto, non-standard locations, and a, a script's never going to be able to capture that properly. So varying OS capabilities. Um, if you imagine a current Linux install, you'll have things like capabilities. If you look at an old Solaris 7 box, there's the set UID and that's pretty much it. There's some managed access control, but that's unlikely to be turned on. Um, but if you're auditing a system, how do, you, how do you effectively audit a system where it doesn't have the capabilities that you would like it to have in order to secure it properly? Um, multiple solutions. So how do you lock an account? There's at least two ways there. Um, they actually have different characteristics. Um, that's not necessarily reflected in people's um, audit documentation. So if you look at CIS and they talk about how to lock an account, that only captures part of it. In my mind, every, everything you can do to lock an account should be done. You shouldn't simply rely on one method. Um, what about stuff that's not turned on but has poor default configurations? Sendmail is a great example. Very few Unix systems these days actually use Sendmail unless they're mail servers. So most people turn it off, but they leave the configuration in a bad state, and then maybe they, somewhere down the line they patch, and they patch and the send mail gets re-enabled, it's now come back on in a weak state. Um, people, people will turn around and go, well, actually we don't need to worry about that send mail configuration because it's not running. That's not always true. Um, <clears throat> differences in requirements. So there are multiple different standards for doing audits. None of them are particularly good. Um, and they kind of depend on the industry they're in. So who here has used the CIS guide for, for, for doing an audit? Um, looked at any of the other stuff? Compared what maybe CIS say and what the DOD say, or maybe, maybe the Nessus implementation of the CIS stuff? Nobody's done much work in, in terms of gap analyzing the situation and checking what each, each, each methodology brings to the party. So some solutions. Better scripts, we can, we can certainly fix some of it with scripts. 
Um, some gap analysis. So this is something I've been working on at the moment. Um, taking all of those policies that exist for, for Unix, for enterprise systems, um, and actually trying to put together a table where I can say that CIS checks for this, DOD doesn't check for this, um, Sun say you should check for this, um, and their definitions and whether the definitions in my mind are appropriate. Now, clearly it would be better if there were more people looking at this, so it's maybe something if you want to come and talk to me afterwards, um, we can take it offline. Um, CCE, so CCE is MITRE's attempt to do what I've just described. Um, it's their common configuration enumeration. It's like CVE, but for configuration flaws, essentially. Um, and they're, so they're attempting to do that, but there are some problems with that, which I'll talk about in a second. Um, gap analysis. I wish someone else had done this. It's, it's a bull ache to do, but it's, I think it needs to be done. Um, CCE, so I said there were some problems with it. It's incomplete. It doesn't cover every OS. It, for example, covers AIX 5.3 doesn't cover six, certainly doesn't cover seven. Um, and I'm not entirely sure I agree with their methodology because they equate, going back to the how do you lock an account thing, their check is essentially, is the account locked? And so they, they, as long as you've done one of the things that will allow you to lock an account, then, 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 then they're happy. But in the case of locking an account, if you change the shell, then when somebody logs in, they can't, they, they'll, they'll get dropped out. If you lock the account, then they won't be, they will, they will never get through that stage. If you ch but going back a step, if you change the shell, they may still be able to log in via FTP, um, and a lot of people lock accounts by essentially changing the shell. So smarter humans. I don't scale very well. Um, and and I, I, the reason that this all started was I want to get the rest of my team up to the, the level I perceive myself to be at so that I can not do quite so many audits of... AIX or HPUX or whatever. Um, and we all need training. Um, so, going further, this is the predominant part of my talk. This is the bit that's important. I'll answer the question about why in a second, but this is the, this, this is the take home section of the talk. Um, in, the, in this section, I'm going to look at the attack surface, I'm going to look at the real world um, and try and give you some ideas of why I don't think. Auditing alone is, is good enough. So why would I want to go further than simply going through a CIS guide or the DOD guide or whoever's guide it happens to be? Um, it fails to answer the simplest of questions. Can I get from role A on a system to role B? Unix systems are by their very nature multi-user. Um, so when I worked at the, at the bank, we put six different types of user onto a system before we even considered applications. So we had storage management people, we had service management people, we had the technical design team, we had a number of levels of operations, and we had our own group, the, the security group. Each of those groups had their own capabilities defined within CD. <clears throat> and in fact, in the end, we got rid of CD because we weren't happy that we could, we could separate the, the, the privileges as much as we'd like. You know, some people had VI and we didn't necessarily want them having VI and breaking out into root. Uh, so we went and bought a big expensive solution, about a million pounds. Um, so at that bank, 10 years ago, we were worried enough about this problem of, of, of segregation of privileges that we spent an awful lot of money trying to fix it. Um, but if you look at what an audit policy that, that CIS or DOD or whoever it happens to be brings out, <coughs> they probably don't even consider separation of privileges. They're more interested in things like, is the MOTD file set? Um, what's the password policy? And that's, that's relevant, but it's not the main risk. If you've given the, your database guy access to the system so he can look at the databases, you don't then want him to be able to go and grab all of the traffic that's coming in from, from the web server. So the attack surface. Um, I've broken this down, and it's quite a high-level description of the attack surface, but essentially what I've done is, for the OS, the enterprise apps, the DevOps, and the end user base, I've attempted to define what they bring to the party in terms of areas of risk. So, for example, the OS, um, the kernel is obviously, the, is, is obviously the, the, the first thing that comes onto the system, and then obviously the services and, and um, management stuff that, that, that ship with the OS. Enterprise apps, well, they obviously bring services, and they often bring batch, batch processes of one description or another, be that cron, be that something that they do internally. Um, 
DevOps, they, they bring a lot of batch jobs with them. Um, they would replace us all with shell scripts if they possibly could do. Um, and they also bring the roles. So these six different types of user, that's where, that's where they appear. And then finally you've got users, and they just bring misfortune and malice. So, in the real world, the OS should protect us from ourselves. Applications will continue to develop new features, um, and they probably won't turn off the features they used to have. And as I said before, DevOps would, all, would replace us all with shell scripts if they could. So, OS flaws. So, I guess these can be broken down to a number of key areas. Um, you firstly have, in the case of Unix, and in the context of the AIX stuff I'm going to be talking about as we go through this presentation, um, standards are a problem. POSIX standards are great as far as they go, but the, in, as, if you've ever read a man page, you'll find that the, the, there are often places where the outcome is undefined under certain conditions. Um, that could be a problem because two implementations can have very different solutions um, simply based on the fact that there's an un undefined error of the standard. Forks, so AIX is simply one of many Unixes, and if you've ever seen the family tree, you'll realize just how much of a mess um, that family tree actually is. So when something, gets, when something gets fixed in one fork of the tree, it doesn't necessarily get fixed in all of them. Um, and therefore you get situations where, for example, you take a globbing bug that was reported in Solaris maybe five years ago, and maybe it's still there in AIX, I wouldn't like to say. Um, you get incorrectly separ implemented separation of privileges. Um, I'll talk about what I mean there in, in due course, but essentially, yeah, there are, there are bugs in the, separa in the privilege separation stuff, and they can be exploited if you, if you can find them. You get poorly, administ poorly implemented administrative features. So these are things where 10, 20 years ago, they seemed like sound de de design decisions, um, and maybe they're not so, not, not so sound in retrospect. Um, and finally, where they've attempted to implement um, anti-exploitation technology, sometimes it just doesn't work as well as it can do. Sometimes it's just not as broad as it needs to be because, it was, again, it was developed in a different age. So some examples. Um, a lot of applications have shared code such as CDE. Oh, sorry, a lot of, oh, of Unixes have shared code such as CDE. Um, for those of you who don't know, the CDE source is now available. I'd, I'd strongly recommend going and having a look because there, there, there is at least one bug um, that, that, that's there that, that should be knocked out at some stage or another. Um, bad defaults. So many Unixes, AIX and Solaris particularly, um, essentially make a lot, of the, a lot of the binaries that get put onto the system owned by bin, but they then get spawned as root. And if you're familiar with the Telnet bug of, of some years back, it was possible to get into a system via Telnet as the bin user. Then if you were to replace the, a, a bin owned file, which is run as root, you, yeah, there's a, there's a privilege escalation vector there. Um, so in the case of AIX, WPAR um, isolation, AIX has this concept of WPAR. They like Solaris zones, they like FreeBSD jails. Um, in AIX's case, they implement it means that if you create a set UID in a WPAR, it's also a set UID on the main OS. So if, for example, you were to be giving your developers root in a WPAR because they need it for the purposes of development, um, but they had access to the underlying system because they, they happen to have, yeah, they, their account gets put onto everything, so they create a set UID inside the WPAR, then when they, then when they log into the, into the underlying system, they've got root. Um, WPAR isolation, they also, on AIX, um, the IDs are essentially shared. So if you run a root process inside the WPAR, it's a root process outside. If you set a, a, a run a, a process that's, say, the TMB user inside, the same ID will be reflected outside. Um, I haven't had a chance to go too much further with that and see whether we can leverage it in any useful ways, but it, it doesn't strike me as um, the soundest of design decisions. And finally, patching may actually be a problem. When I considered this initially, I only had one view of why patching might be a problem, and that was simply the fact that AIX is patching implementation. Um, it's like Windows Update, but it connects over HTTP to IBM. 
It grabs an XML from there, which has essentially a list of FTP sites to go to to get the e-fixes. Um, I'm sure you can see why that might be a problem. Um, but as, as, as my esteemed friend pointed out yesterday, patching is also a problem because when you install a patch, maybe it will reg regress the state of the system in terms of the system hardening you've done. So go back to the send mail example. Send mail may now appear to be on. So anti-exploitation mitigations in AIX. Um, I didn't expect to find any. Um, as it turns out, you'll look at a column and you'll go no, 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 no. But there's lots of caveats there, so we'll look at a few of them in turn. Um, the non-executable stack. The so AIX has a non-executable stack. By default, it's essentially configured in select mode, which is it's like opt-in in Windows. So essentially, binaries have to, have to ask for it. Um, that would be fine if IBM were, were packaging up their, their set UIDs so that they opted in, but they don't. So in, you can see in that command there, that's essentially a, a looking for anything that doesn't have system defined against it. System is essentially the state where it refers back to what said manager says. Um, and there's the simply nothing. Everything is set to, to whatever the system does, and the system says select, so nothing opts in. ASLR. So I didn't think IBM had any content of ASLR. I discovered that they kind of do, but it's kind of interesting how they do it. So every time you install or uninstall, um, a, for this, in this example, libc, but more generally, <coughs> libraries, binaries, and the rest of it, it gets rebased and it actually introduces about 20 bits of entropy. Um, I'm not sure how they're doing it, but I'd like to find out. I'd also like to find out if we can, if we, if we can do anything useful to bypass it. I mean, I guess the things like relative jumps and the like, but I, those, yeah. It, what it means in practical terms is when you go grab shellcode off the internet for AIX, unless it's directly calling syscalls, which aren't documented by IBM, IBM make no documentation about the syscall stuff. If it's using libc stuff, it's probably not going to work on your system because it's assumed that the, the, the base address is the, is the address that it was on the, on the dude that wrote the, wrote the code stuff. Um, and yeah, so you have to do syscall stuff. Um, and there's not too much documentation about that. If you're looking at common shellcode, the likes of exec, listen, you can probably reverse that and find out what the syscall should be. But if there are things like syscalls that are related to the WPAS. There's no documentation that would, would allow you to identify what these syscalls are, what they do. There's, yeah, it, it, it needs to be properly investigated. So hardened malloc. Again, somewhere I didn't expect IBM to have anything in this space. I kind of assumed that like Solaris and like HPUX, that the, yeah, it was pretty much a stock malloc and there wouldn't be much you could do. As it turns out, they do, actually have a, they do actually have a hardened malloc. It's one of three different mallocs they have. Um, user selectable, even on a set UID binary. And in fact, if you look here, I've selected Watson, which is the hardened implementation. And, and by default, quite happily, blah will pop out. Um, if you set catch overflow, then you get a segmentation fault. This isn't on by default, probably should be. IBM's reasoning for why it's not, it uses a bit more memory. Because um, it allocates guard pages. I would strongly recommend that that setting was turned on. Um, I'd be curious to see how bad the performance issues are that, my, that IBM won't recommend it's turned on. But it, it looks useful. Interestingly, Watson also has another feature. It has the feature that you can actually continue where, where otherwise the application would have aborted. So if you change catch overflow to continue, if, if Watson would have aborted because an operation would have failed for, I guess, things like allocating and not having enough space to allocate, it will simply continue. That could be quite interesting, especially since, as I say, set UID binaries will still trust this and will, will still will, 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 will honour it. So enterprise features. This is the real value of your system, and this is the bit that auditing really, 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 really misses because they're in, in non-standard locations. You perhaps don't even know what's installed on the system. Um, it's full of interesting code, and my experience tells me that people simply don't look at it. Everybody assumes that somebody else has done the hard work of, of assessing whether something is, is secure or not. And in some cases, things like MQ, DB2, maybe someone has, someone has done a little bit of work, but in a lot of cases, 
it's simply not being considered. So the kinds of interesting code that you're likely to come across if you start looking for it. Backdoors, proprietary postcodes, embedded library copies. So how many implementations of XML are, are there out there and which is the most popular? Lib XML and, and the like are more common than you'd think and they're often not patched because they're embedded inside whatever application it happens to be. Um, insecure API usage. So Microsoft have got their SDL, they've got their APIs that they consider harmful and they prevent developers using them or they attempt to prevent developers using them, I should say. Um, that simply doesn't happen in the enterprise world. There, there, there has been no SDL applied to AIX or to my knowledge any of the other Unixes that are out there. It's simply relied on developers good practice in the past and it's yeah it, it's a problem um, key material and entropy it's not directly code but it certainly comes under the bracket of, of an application install and what, what that might bring to the party um, again auditing won't capture problems with key material and entropy um, so if you think of something like SSH it's not turned on by default on AIX but where it turns on, it's going to generate its keys when it starts, when the, when the service starts. Probably not the best time, particularly if the entropy implementation isn't, isn't up to, to scratch. Again, nobody's even looked as far as I know at the, at the, at the, at the random implementation on AX, let alone set, giving it a yes, this, this is acceptable. Um, and finally, Java. Um, it gets a lot of bad press, and it deserves to. <laughs> There's, there are an awful lot of applications that use Java um, and there's an awful lot of developers out there that st simply stick their Java applications onto boxes and assume that it's going to be fine. When I have time when I'm doing an audit, I'll go looking for the jar files and start, start taking, a look, taking a look into what, what the code is actually doing because if you've got a listing service and it's running a proprietary protocol and it's written in Java, that's a particularly quick win. So practicing unsafe DevOps. So we've talked about the OS, we've talked about the applications. What about the people that manage these systems? Surely they must be able to do something useful to keep, keep things secure. Um, well, nine times out of 10, no. And these are some of the reasons why. Build infrastructure. People don't build boxes properly. If they do build boxes properly, they probably leave their build infrastructure in an insecure state. The number of times you'll see interesting things like Maybe a web server in the DMZ with an NFS mount into the internal network um, with all of the install files for whatever it happens to be. So that you've got two issues there. You've got the ability to start looking at, at stuff that's being installed in the DMZ and stuff that's being installed outside. You've also presumably got rules in the file that allow NFS to work. Probably not the wisest of decisions. Cron. So I said that, that DevOps would replace us all with shell scripts. Cron is one place where they, they're, they're particularly thorough at doing this. Um, I'd say probably about 50% of the systems we audit, we can get from a low-level user to root via Cron and via a script that's being called from Cron. Um, but again, audit, audit requirements ne would never capture this. They won't go through a corn, sh corn script and identify that it's writing to temp and that, that there's no permissions. And yeah, it, it just doesn't capture it. Our hosts. In the context of AIX, our hosts are still important. They're not so much important if you're looking at Solaris, but AIX, very important because AIX build infrastructure. NIM uses our host to essentially allow the, the, the master environment to essentially replicate out into, in, in, into its um, hardware partitions. And they do this with our host, and it's generally, that, generally worse configured than it you would. Up this thing has. Generally worse considered than even you'd expect it to be. So you'd not, you, you know, for example, that our host is generally bad, but they've managed to make it even worse because, for example, they don't fully qualify domains. Um, they, they, it, this is all running under the root user, not, not um, low privileged users, that kind of thing. Um, user provisioning and access. So stepping beyond simply our hosts. There's other ways that access is provisioned to systems, generally SSH. Um, audit requirements very rarely capture the fact that, for example, um, SSH keys may not be encrypted. Um, there's a wealth of ways to get into, in, into these things. 
thanks to our lovely DevOps folks. Um, I've mentioned key material already, um, and I've also mentioned NFS, so we'll move on. Um, so this is an example of the kinds of things you see on customer sites. Uh, so this is a shell script that gets run by the root user. It starts the victim um, start.sh um, shell script. And if you look at what it's actually doing, it's setting a silly umask. It's changing the output directory to slash temp, and, it's, and then it's writing to it. Can anyone see a problem with that? No? OK, so the issue is, is because it's writing to temp, which is somewhere that everyone can get access to, you stick a sim link in there, and then essentially you can repoint where the, where the output goes to to another part of the file system. And you can either potentially write over something that exists or potentially create a new file. And then depending on what, what's actually being output, maybe you can control the data to the degree that you can create an R-host file in, in root. So in the lab, so we've talked about some of what we see when we're with clients. Why, what are we doing to try and make things better? Um, we're buying more systems. We're reading more books. We're looking at more code. We're playing with the tools that exist and trying to develop our own. And we're trying to develop some new techniques that, 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 that give us a better visibility of the security of systems. So systems, buy or emulate as much as you possibly can do. This laptop's got eight different VMs for different Unix flavors on it. Um, We've got AIX, AS400, HPUX, Solaris. We've, we've got a variety of stuff in the labs, and we're actually actively trying to find problems with it. Don't just rely on the CIS guide. Books. If you understand how one OS works, you might be in a better position to understand another one. Um, a particular case in point is the Solaris Systems Programming and the Systems Internals books. A fantastic resources. Not only do they have Lovely mathematical proofs for why Solaris's um, privilege separation is right and good and proper, but they have more, more practical things. There's a more efficient implementation of the Chirrut break um, that's, in, that's in Solaris internals. Wealth of knowledge. Um, and man pages. Man pages are good. Um, if, you, if, you, if you can take them with you, even better, but they're, they're on the internet. Go look at them when you're looking at systems. See what, see, what, see what AIX has said versus what Sun said. For, for essentially the, the, the same class of, of issue, You're, if you look at the gaps between implementations, you might actually find where there are flaws. So code. Next time code leaks, take a look. Your adversaries will. Um, I'm your adversary in the context of this. If code comes out, we'll be grabbing a copy to try and take a look. Sometimes it's really useful. So um, the CDE implementation in AIX and in Solaris has an RPC service, which is, is, is crashable. I found it by crashing it on AIX. Um, but the stack trace on AIX is completely munged. You get nothing useful. You, if you do the same crash on a Solaris box, you'll get each of the functions in the call chain. And if you've got each of the functions in the call chain, and you've now got the source because the CDE is now available, you can probably have a far quicker win in terms of trying to turn this into some, something useful, or at least establishing if it's not. Um, look at lists like OSS security. So if you we'll go back to what I said about embedded libraries and the fact that often these, 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 these are there. Um, when something gets reported by the open source community, it does get shouted about. It, go, it goes out to full disclosure, but it also goes out to more technical lists like OSS security. And if you're keeping track of what's coming out in terms of open source bugs, you'll probably find a good number of them are, are also um, the case in more esoteric environments like AIX. And I, to go back and labor a point, jar files are readable. So the tools we use, some real dummy tools there, strings and grep. AIX is built on essentially a, a nest of magic environment variables that, that make the, the system change its state. So I showed the example of the malloc stuff earlier. There's, I think there's about 50 different environment variables that affect libc just from a runtime linker perspective. Everything has sh environment variables. Quickest way to find environment variables is actually just, str is actually just strings of file in grep for capital letters. And you'll, you'll, you'll be amazed what you fi find um, binaries actually support. Um, so, trust and trace, 
So Strace is Linux, Truss is Solaris, AIX, HPX, more, more enterprisey stuff. But they're incredibly useful too. Great for getting an understanding of what the binary is actually trying to do. There are some binaries we know very clearly what, what they're meant to do. You know, something like SU, that's, that's fairly self-explanatory. But when it comes to the stuff that's maybe installed as part of an enterprise application, it's always useful to, better, to, to get a better visibility of it. Obshunt, GDB, and IDA. Once you've identified that there's a binary of interest, yeah, you need to decompile it and work, do, do the hard work. Um, and to go back to label the point still further, JAD, GD, JD, GUI, and friends for Java stuff. Um, if at all possible, get the compilers for the OSs that you're build reviewing um, or auditing. It's really useful to be able to turn up and actually knock out a quick 10-line exploit for something. And as I said, given that shell code is, is relying on, in many cases, libc and libc, and libc having randomized addresses, um, you're, you are going to have to manipulate things at times. Uh, Checksec.sh, which is a tool written, I'm trying to think of his name, um, but it's, it's, it's essentially a tool that analyzes binaries and says whether ASLR has been turned on, um, whether the ASLR covers everything, or whether it's just covering the main, pro, the main, main application code. Um, and finally, Unix privs check. So some techniques. I've already mentioned this one, but yes, sometimes if you recreate the crash on another OS, you might get more joy with it. Um, Binaries can always, always be exploited via environment variables. That's definitely the case on IBM. We've got at least three local routes that are essentially based on poorly, poorly <coughs> trusting applications that, that take environment variables and do silly things with it. Um, old techniques can be reapplied. Um, the glob style bugs still affect AIX because they simply didn't patch it when other people did. Um, more techniques. Auditing, the other kind is kind of quite useful. So on AIX you have Audit D, uh, Solaris you've got, you've got the BSM auditing, Linux you've got it. Turn it on whilst you're building the system and look what it's at, what's, what's actually occurring. Because things like creating files in temp can often be quite quick and they might have a predictable name. And if you know the predictable name, you might better get root. Something to look out for. And check what libraries enterprise apps ship with. And in particular JVMs. So this laptop, um, the virtual machine I use for doing IBM stuff, has MQ, DB2, and a couple of other bits and pieces. There are four different JVMs on there outside of the, the main Debian OS one. Um, and they're all different versions. And um, yeah, they're, they're, they're all probably vulnerable because they're old versions. And they, yeah, they're there for free. So, the original inspiration for this talk was um, some stuff I was doing with linkers um, more generally across the different Unixes. And one of the things we found was that the ELF runtime linkers for, for things like Solaris um, and for Linux had this concept of DTR path, which essentially allows an application to specify in its own binary where it should look for, for libraries. And this is problematic because some of these binaries may be set your ID. And in particular, KBB ACF1, which is part of Tivoli, um, and part of DB2 fits this category. Um, and we were, we, were, we were trying to work out whether AIX had a similar feature. Turns out it does. And in fact, if you look in the string, you'll see the third one is empty. That's essentially the same as saying the current working directory. So on that, when it's looking for a library, it will look in user lib, it will look in lib, and it'll look in the current working directory. It calls library library files that aren't standard OS stuff, and it will look in current working directory. Draw your own conclusions. This bug is exploitable. Um, we've seen it on pretty much every IBM site we've been to. So, you know, when I say IBM site, I mean customers of IBM. Um, and we've seen it, yeah, we've seen it everywhere. And when we reported it, we reported it sometime last, some, summer last year, um, IBM finally issued a patch 12 months later. Um, their patch was remove the set UID bit. Not great if you actually required the functionality. Um, the best bit, though, was the fact that ISX X-Force, which is part of IBM, picked up our report almost immediately it came out, but didn't bother to tell the rest of IBM that they'd, <laughs> they'd seen this bug. <laughs> so Unix Privesk check. Um, 
So a lot of the stuff I've talked about and a lot of the stuff that we're trying to do in terms of impr imp improving Unix um, auditing in general is being rolled into Unix Privesk check. Unix Privesk check, for those of you who don't know, was started by Pentest Monkey, one of my colleagues, um, and at the, at the time of this talk was essentially a monolithic shell script. On my laptop is, a, is, a, is essentially a rewrite because um, I got fed up with maintaining his code. But it's a sen it, I, what I've essentially attempted to do is define a, sen a standard library that will be available. Um, and then, so you port the standard library to a new Unix, and then all of the checks that hang off the back of that will automatically start, wor start working magically. Um, it's, it's a work in progress, but I'm hoping to have some code up rather soon. So, let's see if we can. Just a quick run through of what Unix Prefest check actually does. So, if you look in there, you'll see there's, there's a shell script, UPC, um, there's a library directory, and then there's an output files cache. So, one of the things the, Unix, the original Unix Prefest check didn't do particularly well was um, behave itself on systems where there were lots of file systems, and maybe some of it was over NFS because it was continually doing finds. Um, so one of the things that the new Unix Privesh check does, it essentially caches all of the outputs, so it only has to go through the file system once, and then the standard library allows us to enumerate that file rather than having to hit the file system every time. Um, I'm not sure it's actually in a fully functioning state, but let's take a look. So if we go into checks, these are some of the checks I've defined so far. So this is, this is what a check looks like, and if you notice, it's not actually got much stuff that looks like Unix commands. Um, but what, it, what we've essentially got is, a, is a, an init function, which gets called when the, libra when the library's loaded, a function that actually does the hard work, and then a, and then a finny, which finish... Hmm? Is that my phone? That's not... Um, so we've got it, we, it, it finishes. The check itself takes essentially a list of passwords um, and it reads each of the usernames and then it goes through and it enumerates whether, the, whether, whether that particular user has, has a password set. That's the kind of thing that, that you'd find in an audit. audit. But at the other end of the scale, we've got things, lo things like... So the bug that I showed with KBACF1, this is a check that will find that on your systems, and this is something that you'll never find in an audit, at least not if you use any of the documented methodologies out there. So it essentially goes through all of the interesting places that, where binaries might live, things that are run at startup, things that are run um, as set UID, and it essentially enumerates, them, enumerates what, what they've got in the way of our paths and whether it's possible. And the bit that's the kicker for me, is that AIX's file format is completely different from Solaris's and completely different from Linux's. And if you were to do it manually, you'd need to be aware of that. As it stands, this check, because it relies on essentially some shared, some shared library code, the shared library code has implemented, the, implemented the, the, the structure that's required for this to work, so you don't actually have to know that. So, conclusions. Ask yourself why you're having the system audited. If it's just a tick in the box exercise and you're literally just going to go through the CIS guide or you're going to get your, your tester to go through the CIS guide, it's worthy. I'm not sure there's that much value. But if you actually care what your, your developers are doing to the system, what your applications are doing to the system, don't get it audited, get it white boxed. Get people on there, get people actually pulling apart the code. Questions? Yeah. When you mentioned about Java, uh, you were speaking about remote exploitable bugs in the server. Uh, yes. I was. I will. I will look f in in the context of when I'm decompiling Java. I'm looking for the app bugs in the uh, application, okay. not necessarily. 
But of course, inherent with the fact that JVM is on the system, there may be bugs that are, that are JVM level bugs which might be useful to you as well. No further questions? Awesome. Uh, that's all finished.